Good evening, everybody. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 371, and this is part of the Modern Needs theme episodes. And tonight, we are covering specifically the Modern Needs Bolo. I know most folks think that Modern Needs is just was uh, just sticks, as well as I did. But apparently, there was a Bolo module, and that's what we're going to hear about tonight. And none other than GM Bron Frank is going to discuss that. And so without further ado, I'm going to be bringing them up. If you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button. And we're just getting started. Uh-huh. My picture came up. We must be live. We are live. Yeah. Yes. And I want you to know, whatever, I can hear you now. When I, for all of you behind the scenes, I was going, Dean, I can't hear you. I can hear you perfectly now. Oh, that's fine. Huh. Okay. Oh, good. good. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like we're sitting, you're sitting right next to me. So oh, for good. all of you who know me, you'll get it. For those of you who don't, Cafe Cebuano, one of my morning cafe, morning videos. The infamous Cafe Cebuano. Yes. <laughs> so as you know, it's kind of doing a modern niece theme episode. So tonight it's going to be on the Bolo. And I think the next I got coming up, I think, is... West Coast camps, East Coast camps, um, a couple other themes. Well, yeah, this coming weekend, next weekend, I'll be yeah. with you at Chad's Progressive Art Chad, right. so, yeah. that, that does kind of fall into the relative camps, which we did cover. But um, so I guess um, so a couple guys sent me questions. One of them is Andres. And his question basically kind of, I kind of put my question his together. There was some parallel there as far as what he wanted to know. And, and what I want to know as well. And so what the question is um, kind of twofold. So here's my question. How did you meet GM Remy and how long did it take? And this is his aspect. How long did it take for you, quote unquote, to get in with him? Um, well, there's sort of two versions to this story because uh some of you, you know, I, I don't usually talk about it, but some of you know I used to be <clears throat> Dr. Indoors, as you can sort of see from back there, <laughs> and with high times. And uh, while I was active and in that world, that's why Remy went, you didn't, I couldn't be openly with him. Mm. And after I officially retired, we were joking around, and I, the way I, I met him at a seminar where he cut through the came through, you know, sort of like Moses parting the ways as I told the story. And he came up to me and said, oh, how long have you done our niece? And I'm like, never done our niece. Well, I mean, did it on my own, but never officially. Mm -hmm. I said, this is Wing Chun. He goes, no, no, that's our niece. And that made me think about, you know, Uncle Bill and uh, Punchy Ron Carlson and Uncle Wayne, who when you'd ask him, oh, oh, I don't know what you, that's a lot. No, no. That's Bagua. Oh, no, that's, you know, whatever their art is, they'd look at you and Remy goes, no, no, that's that's our niece. And I, I find Wing Chun and our niece go together really well. And I had done private training because when William Chung came over, everyone yeah. wanted to do Chi Sao. Everyone wanted to do you know, punching. And he wanted to teach Bart Cham, though. Okay. So I did three five-day camps in a row with him doing Bar Chamdo, and he started bringing me up to his room. The photographer sucked. I ended up doing his photography, and I always wanted uh, the cut. Um, so I met Remy because he came through, and he said, oh, never said I'm Grandmaster Prasus, never said I'm Professor Prasus. When I first met him, he looked at me and said, my name's Remy. What's your name? And I said, Bram. And he goes, Bram, my name's Remy. I'm going to be your friend for life. You're going to hmm. be my friend for life grabs me, pulls me up to the front of the room, proceeds to use me as a Zuki the whole day. Dean, I didn't know about tapping out. So he's beating <laughs> the snot out of me. And, you know, at one point he leans over and goes, doesn't that hurt? And I'm like, yes. So from him, like, it hurts, you must tap out. So as soon as he started hurt, I tapped out. And he goes, no, no, that does not hurt. You're cheating. And then he went, I, I thought I was going to die. And he goes, that hurts. Yeah. And, you know, and he didn't stop. He didn't go any further, and I learned that tapping just meant he would stop at that point. He didn't release oh, okay. the hold. He just didn't really go much further. Got it. But um, he and I bonded on day one. Yeah. Like I said, there was no um, Grandmaster Prasas. There's no um, Professor Prasas. He took me in and said, I'm Remy. Mm. 
Next thing I know, he was, I was going to see him. I would meet him places. And right after that, I moved to Florida. And he moved, you know, he would come stay with me in Florida. Okay. He said, oh, it's just like, you know, the Philippines. And I lived right on Miami Beach. And he'd walk out my back door onto the beach. And I was pretty close to South Beach. And uh, I was with him for 21 years after that, after he was alive. And I think he's actually been passed as long as he I was with him. So, you know, I have mm. a 40-year period. But he knew I always wanted blades from day one because um, I've told other people that, and you know, because you're, I always wanted to be an archaeologist about arms and armor. I've studied arms and armor my whole life. That and dinosaurs. I know, weird combination. And I've had a knife in my hand since I was four. And every martial art I did when I asked about weapons, they'd go, we'll get to that. You go through these ranks, we'll get yeah. to that. Like, I don't want to get to that. I don't care no. about this part. No. I want to be in like normal. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and uh, I always had a knife. So we were at a camp. Remy gave everyone had a someone cut down sticks for us so we could do a spotty daga. And I'm like, what is this? And they went, It's your knife. Now I used to make swords and armor in my dad's shop out of wood and stuff, because I was a kid. Mm. So I was learning, you know, I did it for you know, Boy Scout, Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. And I'm the kid sitting with help with my dad helping me teach me how to use um, early versions of band saws and stuff and cutting out swords and making cross cross hilts and yeah. making helmets and shields and you know i don't know kids played regular army together they came to my house we put on armor we played knights in armor out in the backfield and uh so i looked at that and overnight i cut the sides of the the stick off so they were flat and then i cut into it and made a blade and ground ground a blade and showed up next day and remy went no problem what is that i said well it's a real knife now it has an mm. edge now i know where it's going and after that, um, some of you may not know, when you make a knife, a lot of times when they talk about full tang or whatever, it's just a solid piece of steel shaped like, and you put handles on it, and then you put a guard on it, you know, and the guard gets soldered around and whatever, or slides up a piece and it's on there. So I started taking pieces of wood, and I went and bought myself a very expensive scroll saw, and I cut out 10 blades at a time. I would bond handles onto them. I cut guards that were two pieces and, you know, bond them on, glue them. I would grind them on a grinding wheel, on a belt grinder, just like you're grinding steel, put okay. grinds in them, and then soak them in polyurethane for, you know, hours and hours and hours. And then I brought them to Remy, and he goes, what are these? And I said, real training knives. We need training knives. That was the start of me making training knives because there were no training knives. Mm. We didn't have training knives. I was so into it. Um, Remy was staying with me. We went up to Jupiter. He wanted to open a school. He said, let's open a school in Jupiter. And I was thinking about moving there. We went up to Jupiter. We went looking at locations. And you've probably heard, you know, a lot of times he'd have a stick in his hand and you'd go, oh, you know, you cut this. And Dan Anderson, you can ask, you know, Grandmaster Dan. He's, Dan thought being a good stick boy and a fighter and a single stick guy, he meant the cutting through the air. You know, it's a cutting motion. And Remy would go in the middle of it. You have to know where the sharp is. You know, if I can touch you, you're cut already and all that stuff. And everyone else, whoosh. Me, I'm salivating going, he's talking about using blades. He's yeah. finally, because he wouldn't talk about it in public. Just like Guru Dan wouldn't really talk about it in public mm -hmm. in the old days. You know, Guru Dan, even in his famous books, would go, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not. He'd show a couple things go, oh, we don't talk about that. Yeah, it was like the... And Remy, you know, in the Philippines, they wanted a, a better society, so they moved away from blades because this is the beauty of the art, and, you know, you don't interfere with Marcos's version of a nice society back then. But Remy occasionally tells stories about his family teaching Bolo, you know, to the, to the gorillas mm. and to fight the Japanese, and they had done Bolo and their family before that. I had never really seen it. And anyways, we're up in Jupiter and we're over by the beach. And he gave me a choice. He started telling me, you know, we taught that to the military. It's not good to teach police and military. It's very unrewarding. He went, 
he told me everything why it was bad and i guess i was supposed to say you're right i don't want to do that and all i did was go okay yeah yeah you know and goes, we won't be able to, you have to pick one or the other you can't do stick and do polo and i was like okay and he goes you're sure you know and he goes no problem and i went look okay i accept i'll do it because mm -hmm. i you know i wanted to cut people you know i wanted to be a knight in shining armor and wave my sword and i'm an old john carter freak so you know put a sword in my hand so i can go after green martians and blue plant men and hack them up and be you know the best swordsman of two worlds you know let me be you know from the round table let me be mm -hmm. on charlemagne let me be you know a real musketeer you know the three musketeers people always think about you they were serious fighters you know so mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm like yeah 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 i want to do it let me be a spanish country i don't care so you know we we start training and cristino vasquez and you know and roberto Presas, who's last one alive and you know but the gock they were there when they told me because remy showed up in miami beach while my friend my most senior student, Tim Olson, who starts training. This is actually a Presas Bolo. Mm. I, have, I have his grandfathers and his uncles. And Cristino said, you know, he told us when he took them off the mantelpiece and brought them to you. The only difference between his uncles and his grandfathers, and I, I should have kept track. I don't think he really knew which was which. There's a, a half inch difference in the size. Okay. And I grabbed them both, but one is mounted up on the wall. So I'm, I'm just not going to climb it. But this actually was before world war ii and lived through world war ii and i've never sharpened it i've never done anything but it still has an edge on it yeah it's very light it's very fast and if you've ever seen guru dan's filipino martial art book if you take this top guard off it's almost identical what he calls a jungle bolo okay and you and i had talked in the past about it you know um machetes are a de-evolution of big knives yeah because big the knives yeah. cut things and have a point to it where i needed to get a point in and mm. make point and cut and have that the weight of the blade disappear as i make my cuts and i go in whereas a machete i need the weight out front to act vines or trees yeah, or right it's heavy, stuff. Heavy. Yeah. And people go well you know bolos come for that i said no there were no working tools that way they were fighting tools first and they're really based on, on you know, like Chinese big knives, uh, Hindi, Hindu Daos, and they have a guard on them. And William Chung had some of the best uh, Wing Chun blades I saw. Consider being those big fat choppers. They looked like fighting buoys. And if you look them up, uh, there's giant families of these Chinese blades, and they're common, and they're not really big because they were used by the people on ships, everything from the red boat, Wing Chun people to being on ships. And that's why naval cutlasses and naval swords are so much shorter than everybody else expects. Because in those days I had all sorts of, you know, I got lines and sheets, I'm in a closed, I can't be cutting the lines and sheets and destroying my ship or getting hung up in it. Mm -hmm. So my cutlass, um, my, my fighting blades, my fighting sabers are all much shorter than I would use on land. And that kind of thing carries out because those people going from China, which is right there, you know, the earth, people picture straight line, the earth is curved actually. Southern China end up down in Luzon. In, not in Luzon, actually, that's what I was saying, but down around the Visayas. And that's where the Spanish ended up. You know, they landed in Cebu. And there's an awful lot of Chinese influence there. And I also tell people you have to understand that without the Philippines, down to Malaysia and up to Indonesia, there's no Sea of China. It's a Pacific Ocean. Right. So everybody going from Southeast Asia, China, wherever, to escape ends up in the Philippines. Okay. Lots of people went there in some of the trade routes, and they brought their, their blades with them. And they look just like bolos. You know, and top, Manny Prado, he actually still puts a guard on his, which actually is better because I can protect my knuckles if someone's swinging mm -hmm. at it. But, you know, I always tell people a bolo, you know, cry a bolento walk and a bolo, a common big knife is the soul of the Philippines. When they can't afford anything, when they would fight for their freedom, 
against the Spanish, against the English, against us. Yeah, right. They fought us for a long time before. Ah, ah, get off the table. I'm sorry. My cat was hopping on the table and mm-hmm. coffee up here. Sorry, we're, we're, uh, we're pet friendly. So no yeah. Problem. She just got through a baby. I know you love Uncle Dean. You have to stay there. I didn't want her to knock this over. And she was trying to slide. Guys, we'll see it later when I demonstrate my arm that I can hold. And, oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah. So I can demonstrate. But she was trying to squeeze between it and everything. Anyways, <clears throat> it's all interconnected. So the Chinese arts went there. Some people still put guards. And after a while, it's easier to make them without guards because they're not made for dueling. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these people, when we talk about and Guru, and Guru Dian talking about jungle bolos, they're made to work in an environment where samurai swords are too big. It's like being on a ship. There's too many trees, too many vines. The Japanese were at a disadvantage with the sword. So wakasashis and tantos become more important because even long rifles with bayonets on them are out of place in the jungle. This is not, and I know you've done this, uh, or we've all done it, where you put the stick on your arm and you're matching a yeah. size to make sure it's the right size. And people, it, it doesn't matter. You know, what's the worst? You bump into yourself. Uh, by the way, this is done by Tack Knife. If anyone's T A K, Tac Knife. Oh, I love, yeah, I love that. Uh, John makes the Praceless Jungle Bolo trainers for me. But mm-hmm. if you put it on your arm, your hand has to be able to go flat wide. Well, that means it's much longer than it's the length of my arm and my hand extends farther. Mm-hmm. Well, that means I can turn inside my arm pretty safely and not cut myself. And I know many people do stick work where they're, they, they load it or they have long sticks. And if it's longer than a Serata stick, which yeah. is almost much, this is only 14 inches plus about a six. Yeah, about Serata 20 sticks are 24. Yeah, so, you know, so a priceless bowl, if you got 14 inches, maybe 20 inches of length total, mm. which is still shorter than most Serata sticks, which are about yeah. 24. Guess what? I can do that with a stick all day. I can do that once. Mm, yeah <laughs> you know uh, and people go what do you mean i said well oh, no. it can be really disastrous you can do it you may not but anyway so the blades actually have a chinese background to them and they become because they're inexpensive and they use them all the time you can find all sorts of people who have done histories of barongs compilons um also you know pick any iconic Filipino blade, the bolo. No one mm. talks about the bolo. It's the lowly big knife. Which is my next question is, you know, obviously modern knees being known for the stick and all that. And I tell you, I, if I hadn't done these interviews, I would have never known that <clears throat> modern knees had, you know, a bolo curriculum. So what? Um, well, he didn't teach it. I was just going to say, why is it not so widely known, and why did he intentionally? not teach it well in david fogey i hope if he's listening or he'll chime in later you know roland dante's learned bolo from remy mm. the late cristino vasquez learned bolo from me so cristino is his first cousin who lived across the street and he might have heard the story of when remy's grandfather uncle and father were teaching remy would hide in the bushes well the kid hiding in the bushes with him was the late cristino vasquez so they would see this, they'd cut piece of stick, and they weren't using it as a stick. They did it, but they saw a bolo. And in Remy's books, you know, and Dan Anderson's done great research, Remy would always say, even in when people were pressing him, doing stick work, he would revert to cutting motions because that's how he would beat them, even though it was a stick in his hand, because they were used to going bang, 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 and he started stroking at them. Inside. Um, yeah. And... He taught, and like I said, almost all of his stuff, if you listen to him, he talks about, you know, the bolo. But because it was the new society, he wasn't teaching. And he didn't have anybody coming up to him going, I want to do this. Well, I, he called me the man with the knife, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the knife guy. And he'd always joke in at seminars. He, I, he would have me, he'd bring people in from the Philippines and go, you know, I paid for the camp. And he'd go, Bram, no problem, no. You go with him. That's why I met Shashir. You go with him. What? Oh, he he does belly song. You go with him. And Shir went, I came to do this camp with Remy. I said, yeah, I paid to do this camp with Remy. What are we supposed to do? He goes, oh, I guess we'll do knife. So I don't, you know, I'm not a, a flippy flippy. For me, once it's open, 
I'm a happy camper because you know what? It's a knife. Modern flippers don't know that, by the way. I've had modern millennial yell at me go what do you think uh valley songs a knife or something and i'm like oh my god you people are so out of touch with what it was but anyways because i always wanted a knife and remy started teaching me bolo he did not teach it in public so roland taught it david knows um mm -hmm. you know in, in ray galang's book masters of the blade i actually ended yeah. up with two chapters rather than one chapter and a lot of it was talking about me and roland and Christino Vasquez, as David did the interviews, talking about Presas Bolo. Okay. And I actually did a tour of Europe with Roland Dante. So I sent you one of the pictures of us doing Bolo. Yeah, yeah. And when I'd be in the Philippines, the only person who did Bolo with me would go, Bram's going to do this, is I would do Bolo. And Christino would push it. And I think you've seen, I was named the, the guardian of the legacy of Presas Bolo. And Remy had said that. And my final certificate is actually from Roberto Presas, who went, oh, yeah. You have the family bolos. Mm. None, they all fell out of use of doing it. For me, I'm playing John Carter. I, you know, I'm a, I'm Sir Bram of the, you know, the Round Table. I'm Marb Knarf of the, you know, the Klingon Nation. I've got my blade out and I'm cutting away. I wanted to do it, and you know, and Remy told me once I did it, I would see the truth because. Mm. Bolo doesn't give you a lot of room for error. Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of room for error on a stick. And he told me, and you have and you understand the beauty of the art is the stick. It's like BJJ. I don't care what anybody says. BJJ is the coolest chess mass match in the world. And every time you watch it, there's something new someone comes up with, a new mm -hmm. counter, a new whatever, and it's so graceful. And you just rock someone and oh, there's that opening. Find that yeah, flow. Yeah, I know. Where you're, you're looking, how do you find that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what stick work has become. You know, not counting the people who want to ba just bang and hit sticks. There's an awful lot of intricate stick work. And Remy said, Oh, Brum, let them have fun. And that's the beauty of the art. Not that you can't hurt someone with a stick, mm. not that you can't do tie them up and do whatever. When Remy first came around, the stick work we learned was stick and cane inserts, take down with cane riot attacks like we're using a nightstick it wasn't we didn't do all the cool tappy tappy you know that came later by that point so when he when he came over do you think part of it was when he's coming when he came to the united states for instance and he's getting these traditional schools campo and all that did he was that part maybe the rationale that he wanted to keep it stick based to complement their curriculum and leave the bolo out the edge weapons out is that well, he didn't even teach it in the Philippines. He had already cut it he, out. He didn't teach it there. Okay. All right. He didn't teach it there. So it's only the late Roland Dantes and the and late Cristino Vasquez. Cousin. Gotcha. Because they needed a clean society. So he didn't teach knife. So is it if you look at the real simple knife stuff he does, people go, how did you get this? And I went, I pestered him endlessly. Yeah. And he's one of his famous lines is, you know, make it your own that you have to need to innovate and translate and i'd watch those motions and he'd do some knife where i go ah i know where this goes and he goes oh tell everyone else all you need is modern artists and i go Rum, you should go find this person and train with them they'll, they'll show you some knife and you know and we'd sit in my living room or um one of my students had a, a small old hotel on the beach and he walk out you could walk right onto the beach so i'd have him stay there if he needed some privacy sort of at the house with me you know, and I go over and we play knife because that's what I wanted. So he he fed me something that I wanted. No one else asked him. Oh, because I'm thinking, I'm wondering, like, it sounds like there was just uh, maybe some outside of relatives, but the cousin, uh, <clears throat> Roland Dante. Yeah, Roland was his best friend in so the world. Like, you guys have got, got the, whole, the whole system of Bolo? Well, some of it. Is hidden. You know, obviously, it's hidden within the stick and stuff. And some mm -hmm. of it is old. What he used to teach talk about Espari Daga, you know, Banda y Banda, and all the stuff that he would do with his family, and you know, training, you know, the the gorillas, mm -hmm. you know, to fight the Japanese, and some of the stuff he would work on the side with me. I never understood. Abani Abaniko with a stick is okay. You know, yeah. Abaniko Corto parallel to my body. Abanico Largo away from my body. Well, this stick, it's okay. I mean, you can sneak in. It's not, a, it's not a power strike and whatever. It's not blasting someone. And, you know, and he and Bobby Tabata, B 
beat the – they're not soft hitters. Yeah. You know, they're not whippy, whippy stick people. They beat the snot out of you. Everything he did hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but on this, when I was learning, because I got to remember um, – can you still hear me? Oh, yeah. No, now we can. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, a call came in, so I was just shutting it off. Um, that – Abanico, because blades have to be able to flex, you know, if you hit edge to edge, they'll shatter. So I started learning like, oh, and I realized when I used to watch him and he would go bang, bang, or two would come in and he'd be in here, you know, bang. And over here for a one and I'm like, ah, I stick it. Guy comes in, bang. And I'd watch his orientation. And when he, a couple times he had blades and when I get it, you know, studying sword, you absorb on the side. Because it flexes. So I can I can hide behind it. I can come up and catch time for an arm. That when this when this arm is coming at me, I can flat it. I can put the flat there and catch his edge on the flat, and then I can pass it. And there's that next abanico. You know, oh, um, yeah. coming yeah. in, I can put the flat there. I can come right back around, and then as I move it, my abanico comes right in. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. That if I hit with a flat, I can pass. So when he was teaching us palace, palace, you know, and then we're doing it with stick that you pass. Part of that, he said, oh, that comes from the cutting from his blade. Mm. And that's what we do with the iconic big blade of America. Again, another one from Jack Knight. Right. Yeah. That I hit with the flat and I pass with it. And that gives me my entry. I hit with it. Right. And I can redirect with the flat and that always keeps my edge in orientation so the more i did it i would report to him and go ah i see the translation mm. and he showed me some basic stuff and because i had a background in sword i loved hema no one really taught it but i i had old manuals my dad used to work at the field day for art museum he worked his way through doing restoration in the museum he was a uh, the late artist illustrator robert gould and he had dual degrees in engineering and in uh, industrial design. But working his way through, when he went to school, Phil F. College of Art and Design, which was part of UPenn back then, and that's where I had gone to school, Phil F. College of Art and Design originally. I followed him to his school while he was at Phil F. Museum. You know, they have big arms and armor section. What the, a lot of the artists did is they grew up learning how to restore paintings and clean up the old art. And do, and have, so, so I have, you know, like a couple old swords. Um, I have a, a single flintlock pistol, from, you know, mm. from Smith before they became Smith and Wesson later on, you know, and my dad. So I spent lots of hours all the time for years and years and years at the Metropolitan Museum in New York studying arms and armor because my dad was friends with him. I'd be on the backside so I could, yeah. touch them, you know, touch them and feel it. Fascinating place. Yeah. And I. So arms and armor, Remy fed it to me because I wanted it. Mm. And it gave him a chance to take probably a part that Roland did and Christina did and gave it to someone who had a passion for it and was making all this stuff. And I always apologize because when he really got me into this, when I finally went, okay, I accept, it's when he was teaching Tappy Tappy. And Bruce will tell you, Chad will tell you, um, because they were part of the whole group with us down here in Florida, that I quit doing all the regular stick seminars. I would not do them. And they said, someone said, why? And I might have told you, but I was doing the big seminar, uh, Bolo seminar with Roland in Germany. Um, Roland had me on the floor teaching and said, you know, Remy gave, Bram has the original Bolos. He's actually taken this very far, you know, and he's the, the you know, the main student of this. Because I, I could, where they did stick and did other stuff, I never stopped. It, it's a passion for me. I fell in love with this tool. But anyways, um, that's when Odessa Ramos started training with me almost 20 years ago. And a very famous Arnisador came over and said, I can do that too. And every time they made contact, they grabbed the blade and ripped it out of my hand. And I just stopped what we're doing. I said, I won. He went, no, no, you lost. <laughs> and I went, no, you have no fingers. I won. Yeah. And, you know, and it didn't matter how often we do it. And Roland was laughing. 
Roland's trying not to embarrass this guy. Odessa's just staring at us. Bombette just stood there. And everything we did, because very simple, I can cover. Look how fast that is. And that's actually the same thing we do with buoys. I cover corner to the corner because it's a saber art. Mm. They really come from old, old arts of this of fighting arts. You're talking about we took Spanish conquistador fighting arts who conquered the world, basically. They were tough people. So I'm go, I can cover corner. And every time he made contact, like I said, he grabbed the blade and he goes, you know what? I wouldn't do that in real. And I go, yes, you would. You were in a safe zone in practice and you can't stop yourself from grabbing the blade. Yeah. And he's like, oh, my God. And he goes, well, you know, and he got all pissed off and left. We, we haven't really talked since then. And I tell people, they go, can't you do both? And I've apologized. My students said, I will let you do both. But if you think under duress, you can do both. You're nuts because you, mm. you, how you train is what you do. And I know that's harsh, but I was with William Chung and he made a comment. And back then I thought, as much as I love the man, I thought it was sort of arrogant. He goes, I will never let you beat me. Never? <laughs> that's what he said. And I went, why? He goes, if you beat me, that's okay. But I will never let you. I will not give you an opening. If you okay. find an opening. I said, why? And he goes, because if I start letting students do that, if they start leaving an opening, I might do that for real. You cannot do that. Like, and I thought of, and it took me a long time. It took me as I progressed teaching combatives, because, you know, I don't teach a lot of civilians, you know, I'm yeah. mostly law enforcement and military for all those years and be in different places. And it, it, I got to understand what they meant. You don't have to go fast. You don't have to go hard, but you cannot go. And I, I sort of fudge. Sometimes I go, can you see the opening? I want mm -hmm. the students to get it, but I got what they meant. So I don't do any kind of, grab the blade i don't do anything where it comes and people do butt striking with a stick right mm -hmm. they we pass the stick down someone pass our, our stick down and we do butt striking we all learn to pass it then we sweep it out and we do whatever i'm on the outside of my body all of my if i'm going to use the butt of the bolo i'm outside my body outside, I'm not no, inside no, my body. Yeah. okay i don't ever do pressure loads why because i'm done and you've seen me because you've taken some of my been good enough because everyone out there i suck at technology so i have to post stuff and send stuff separately for dean to put up for me because i don't know how to send them this stuff or do whatever but I see, when i do dual let me just pop this one out because i have a metal trainer too that my body moves back and forth I don't weave yeah. my arms because if I weave my arms, my hands might be in the way. And a lot of people do it with stick it, bump their hands, bump the stick into their wrists, or they mm. catch their elbows. Guess what? Well, that's my elbow going all the way to your house. Yeah. Because I cut it off. So I only mm. have, and I'll go all the way back. When I cut, and when I cut, I don't ever retract. My left hand, the only reason it comes back is. My right shoulder is coming forward, so it has no choice but to come back. I only cut. I never retract because the other hip pulls it, and I've learned about keeping that edge out there. Mm. I don't cross my hands. People go, do you have both hands? I said, I don't put both hands in the field to play at the same time. Why? Yeah, lined up. You know, both because, hands. by the way, this is my tackle bolo. This is what I designed for the teams. This is okay. L60 with a third tough handle. Mm. Okay. And it's just big enough to go inside my arms that I can smack with it and go with it. And you don't want to bump into your own blade. And of course, you know, I'm, as Remy said, I'm the, the knife guy. I design knives, I make knives. And you've seen, you know, I'll cut, then I'll check. Mm. You know, and I, if I'm under the arm, I stay under the arm. If I'm over the arm, I'm over. I never, if I'm under the arm, I don't cut up. Why? Yeah. My own arm might be in the way. If I'm over the arm, I don't try to cut under. My own arm might be in the way. To go, well, you can get there. Mm, I guess I could, but I'm not going to practice yeah. doing that. And you've been there. I know the length of the tool 
lets us cheat. Oh, I can, if there's a barrier there, at the barrier, that if I hit and I'm under, oh, the length of the stick lets me go over and hit the guy, right? So the guy's head would be there. So I hit, I come over, his arm, I'm on, and oh, I can get it. Look, well, I don't want to do that because one trap and I'm stuck. I don't want to put myself in that spot because I might trap myself up. So Bolo he used to tell me, Blade will teach you truth. And it does. Yeah. Because one person drips, the other person gushes. Yeah. Quickly becomes one person gushes, the other person has a toe tag. Um, some of you know I used to teach commandments and steel in Israel. I'm the father of Israeli Filipino knife combatives, and I'm the one who brought Filipino martial arts to Israel many, many years ago. And I, I sent you the recording from Dennis. Yeah. You know, the, remember the voice recording because uh, Dennis Hanover is actually the, the soul of uh, Israeli martial arts over there. And he let me, you know, came and tested me in a way. Uh, we made our, our peace. He's my mentor, my older brother. Um, my family's, by the way, has been in Israel since 1918. And that's how I got access to teach a lot of people there when I would go. But I teach knife there and I've brought knife there. But the reality is you have to be careful where your hands are. I don't do anything that I can't do. So my stuff is very simple. Mm -hmm. I, un like I said, um, you know, we consider abanico, especially largo. If you roll your wrist and if I do redondas in the air, oh, guess what? That's buoy back cutting. That's saber cutting. That's cutting with that mm -hmm. saber where my back edge comes in. So I can do abanico, but if I do abanico and I let that secondary swedge cut, well, bang. And I can be in here and I can get those cuts in there really quickly rather than the length of what we do with the stick a lot of times. So a lot of times I – because if you're attacking me and I'm saying – I'll intercept with the strongest part of my blade as Remy would do. Many of us had Remy catch and pass us, and he would hook mm. us and throw us. Well, the butt of the bolo – it's designed to do that. It's got a notch on it. It's right, got the, yeah, the yeah. bird beak. And whether or not it's got this secondary ridge, it's designed because a lot of times he would grab me with the butt of the stick and barely have and then go for a forearm throw. Mm. I said, how did you do that? And a lot of times he'd do that entry of, oh, here's Abanico uh, that I – it's coming in. And my Abanico is a quick corner to corner so I can stop it. And when he would say, go with the force, well, force the force is I stop it. Go with the force is wherever direction he pushes me after I go. And, of course, palace, palace is I go with the force. And I found that, that meet the force became the easiest because I get it there just for that momentary hit. And that became I understood the application of Abanico because wherever this guy pushed me, I went with it to come back up. Mm. And then. With a blade of an eco, and I don't know if you've ever seen his pink book, um, but in oh, his yeah. pink book, um, you know, he talks and he shows very clearly. Says, Abanico corto, planting rice side to side. Abanico largo is 90 degrees from me. Well, all of that, like I said, is sort of effective with a stick. It's really effective with a blade. So I started learning how to protect my corners. First time I did, Danny Anderson said, you know, one, I can tell you used to box. Not great at it. Um, I was a punching bag for Mary Kudla, who was a very, very good upcoming professional young lady boxer. I just had to be the right size for her to beat up. So I learned only because she beat the snot out of me. But I hide behind my shoulders a lot. you know. Mm -hmm. And I do that even in my Wing Chun. I hide behind my shoulders so you can't get a clean shot. Well, I do that same crabbing. I'm not expansive. Yeah. I'll crab in with my blade, and you've seen me at Timber, and I'll absorb. I'll step right into your attack, bang, and I let. And then I do something that Remy taught me in the side. I don't do cutting from way out here. I'll be, and you've seen me. I run the blade because I learned from cutting. You know, with a, a Bram buoy, that when I got mm -hmm. in, if I can touch you, it's chef cutting. So I either do. A, a slice cut or I do a chef cut if I can touch you you're cut already 
And I started going, if I follow Remy's comments and I apply it to known sword cuts and known stuff I actually do with a knife in a kitchen, it started making sense. So if I can touch you and you start to move away and I just keep contact and follow you, you're cut already. If I touch you and you come at me and I pull back, well, that's a slice cut. Right. Just as I retreat, I slice when I go. Once I make contact, and I didn't really pay attention. And Bruce Chu, Grandmaster Bruce Chu, you know Bruce. Yeah. He and Chad always look up, and now Dan does too. They, and Brian's all in. So go, you've been lying to us. I said, about what? And they go, we've been watching. You do tappy tappy with a blade. You just don't. You just don't grab the other guy's blade. You grab his hand. Do it. We go. We're watching. You're no different than us. You actually do the same moves we do. You just use a blade and went, no, I don't. No, I don't. And, but hey, it speaking turns of, out, uh, David Fogey's here. David, 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 I brought you up and said that Roland, that you did great interviews with me and that Roland mm. and Christina were the only two to really do Bolo. And that, you know, David's got a bunch of it because people don't know. And, you know. He's saying Rusty Santos was involved in teaching Bolo to the military with Professor Remy Presses and Guru Roland Dantes. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't get really know Rusty, but obviously I knew uh, Guru Roland. And you know, Modi might know, you know, David is like basically, as far as I'm concerned, the inheritor of Roland's art. And he yeah. took care of Roland for years. He was like inseparable. He was the guy there who always took care of Roland, was private student, mm. part of his family. So yeah, and David knows a lot of stuff about the back stuff. But David did those interviews with me into Blitz magazine and into Ray Galang's book. And that's what I, you know, when I was with Roland um, and Christino, they were the ones I knew who did Bolo. Who did the I'm Bolo? I was honored to, you know, to have pe part of it because it's something I can go teach. Everybody yeah. does stick. So I told all my guys, and I have a whole group cadre of Bolo instructors. I go, look, in Remy's honor, we're going to call it. Presas Arnis, which I've always called it, unlike someone else who will remain nameless because I can't deal with him. Um, you know, that we'll just call it from the Presas family style, you know, that's the Presas Arnis, and it's the precursor to what becomes modern Arnis. And I can't help but put what modern Arnis in it because I spent too many years doing it. Yeah. So no, 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 yeah. I mean, right. You've been exposed. And, I, and I, people go, "Is this what his his father and his grandfather and his uncle taught?" And I said, "Well, I'm sure it's in there, but I've had call it thirty something years of my life on top of whatever I did, you know, the other stick work that I've been allowed to innovate and translate." He's been gone twenty something years, and I've never stopped doing what he said: innovate, translate it, make it your own. So I teach my guys. Everybody does stick. If you want to offer them something, walk in and go, look, I'm not going to teach you stick guys how to do stick or say mine's better than yours or you should do this. Mm -hmm. Walk in and go, look, let me show you a different kind of application. Let me show you Presas Bolo and help spread and keep the legacy of Remy's art and the Presas family alive and go, okay, let me digress one thing. Um, I think one of the leading exponents of modern buoy work is obviously James Keating. And I've had people go, how does he know that's what they really did? And I'm like, well, you know, he doesn't. But he researched it all the time. His family is very Western and had buoys. Mm. He knows lots of other arts. And he was smart enough to work with buoys all the time and come up with his famous buoy series. You know what? As far as I'm concerned, he's the living buoy expert. Why? Because they all are doing it. Yeah. A lot of the guys who do HEMA, no one's teaching HEMA anymore. There's people who are reading the, finally we're getting old sword manuals. Man, the they're manual. following. And if you're not a sword person, if you're not a martial art person, it doesn't really make any sense. But because they have a background, these people are bringing it back to life. Is it what they exactly did back then? Maybe not. But because they try and try, when they find something that works better, they go, oh, this is the piece that's not said because the writers of those manuals back then expected you to have a background. So they didn't have to tell every detail. Well, and what I'm talking about is 
So when I'm using the bolo, there's a bunch of what he taught me. There's a bunch of what he led me to. There's a bunch of Bram taking his own experiences and adding to it. And the other reason I teach bolo, Dean, so I don't forget, is I don't carry a stick around. Mm. I do carry a pocket knife. But in today's world, teaching samurai sword or, bro, you know, old medieval sword work or for wrong, none of that exists. But people carry machetes everywhere. It's a number one terror tool in the Latin, world. Latin, look at Latin America. <laughs> everywhere. Africa, Asia. Yeah. We've made machetes really cheap. And, and, you know, in the old days, you'd never throw away a sword. Remy did a demo with Roland at Madison Square Garden, as an example. You know, and the sparks are fine from the machetes because they did it in the dark. Just doing single center wally, so and basic single six sparring. So they knew basically where they're going. You know, it, it's a safe way to do it. They're moving really fast. And afterwards, the blades are destroyed. Mm. I said, sir, because I'll promise it looks good. I said, I know it, but they're destroyed. He goes, oh, it's okay. We throw them away. It's modern. And I thought about it. It's disposable. People don't understand. And Chad and I did this at one of my camps. I bought two brand new machetes. I said, so I blocked as Chad came in, he grabbed the arm again, that I'm blocking flat to mm. his blade. And every time he struck at me, I hit with a flat and would shift him. And then we showed people the blade. Well, my blade had a couple score marks, you know, marks. You can see nothing wrong. Chad was, Ed was starting to roll. Then when we're done, then we started doing, it's coming in and, what am I going to do? Oh, well, I hit edge to edge like we do with the stick. Because that's what he used to tell me. Your knuckles are the edge. And the attack. Yeah. So we're doing that. After a bunch of times, it looked like we had serrated blades. Yeah. It destroyed the edge. And I go, can you see that stick and blade are not the same? And the truth of what it is is hidden there, but you have to know it. So on the flat, I can preserve my edge. And if I hit you with the flat, you're right. Notice I don't have to move. If I do abanico and block that. You're right there in front of my edge. Right, right, right. Did I catch and come over? Oh, you're right in front of my edge, and I could saw in and go. So I, Remy was right. I learned a, a lot the more I've used Bolo. And, you know, like I said, from the first time I met Remy, I made training knives. That's why I started my first company, uh, Dragon Tooth. And then I moved off the new one when I let that one go. I have Dragon Nails. You know, I designed and make knives. I have for yeah. over 30 years. And I have reworked some of the bolo. I have the family that made the original bolos who still make them for me. And they won't make them for anybody else. So I can preserve the legacy of, uh, you know, precious bolo that way. And they never made trainers before me because I'm a training guy. I got them to start making metal trainers. Right. And at first, they're like the knife companies. Nobody wanted to make a training knife. Well, you're a martial artist. You use a live blade or you need a trainer. Training, you train it. But in the knife world, when I first went in it, martial arts guys weren't in the knife world. We used whatever knife they were selling on the market, and we used it for martial application. And we all commented to do this or this or that. No one out. Spyderco had, for example, when I went to him, they had no tactical program at all. Bob Taylor from Recat, who first brought me in, that's what he talked about. That's mm -hmm. all he cared about. So he was the first one to make my knife and make a trainer. I went over to Spyderco. I started their NBC program. And I, part of the deal was you have to make a trainer. And they went, why? And I went, I need a trainer. Martial arts guys need train. I don't care about the live blade. So what that's doing is so I got them. And everywhere I go, I make trainers. And they, you know, Knives Illustrated said, you know, I'm the father of the modern training drum because they didn't exist before me. You know, I made and I made the Endura and Delica trainer. You know, I put firearms colors red handles on them so they're like red guns mm. red guns are safe trainers and the crimps uh my crimps are like blue guns they're working tools any other colors live i think i told the story gaston glock went you know we do that for safety and i said yes sir I'm a tactical guy tactical firearms guy i get it my red drone is like your red gun my blue crimp is like your blue sim gun any other colors live but anyways when i got these the guys to understand what i wanted they now sell, they make trainer, metal trainers exactly as they make their live blades, just without a grind on them, same temper right. and everything. And I've doubled their production because obviously all the martial arts guys go, 
We need trainers. I'm not going to really take a, a live blade and practice with it or hack someone up. Yeah, we yeah. do some cutting drills, but we've made training knives normal. Hey, how many? So you have a student base. So part of your program, do you actually have a separate module where you're just giving students just prices bolo? Yeah. Yeah. And that's oh, what my instructor okay. camp, at my birthday batch instructor camp, we do my modular system, my blade system. And then we spend part of the time doing bolo. Mm -hmm. And it's just a separate thing because I don't teach stick to people. We only do bolo. And I have people no, come I to actually, me. That's, I, think that's I have people neat. from other arts, other F FMA arts. You know, Dean, you've got my book, as I said. You know, they're, they're like the stars in the sky. It's an infinite number. I don't think any style is better than any other style. Right. I think. And you know me. I'm like the, the, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, the, the Holy Trinity. And the, the Holy Triangle, you know, Pythagoras and the whole bit. I find that, <laughs> that, you know, there's cultural, traditional FMA. And I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if it's everything from simple to the most fancy, artsy, whatever. That's cultural. And all of it's good. You pick the one you want. Then you have sport. And everything you have from people just have a stick in their hand and want to beat each other to death. Because of all the way to, and I'll let me pick a weak cuff, you know, and full body armor and boom, boom, boom. I don't care what extreme it is. And, you know, and Shashir and Akal is trying to follow Remy's dream. And he's the one who's taken uh, the padded stick version and minimum armor uh, they used in the Southeast Asian Games trying to make an Olympic sport. Yeah. So, you know, Shashir is really going for, you know, and again, he picked a, a, something that of Remy wanted. That's what he's going to do. We have enough people to do cultural, traditional. And then you have combatives. And I don't care what level of combatives is. All three of these pieces, these three points on the triangle, have something in common. They cannot compete in each other's venues. Mm. They are not the same animal. Under duress, might I use some of these things in each one of these venues? Yeah, I might. But they don't exist in each other's world. Do they have a commonality? Yes. The final answer from each of these things, no, they have nothing in common. You know, there's a, a big difference. I never argue with other people who teach combatives because, you know, it, it's a matter of perspective. You know, where are you? What do you do? Um, I teach bolo to my teams, and I have guys, SWAT teams, ICE teams, uh, different military units, and they carry the bolo with them, this one, mm. because they encounter especially in cartels, people with machetes. Yeah. So I teach them this. That guy's just swinging away what I do. And I teach them. They don't have a lot of room. They're not dueling. I know a lot of people want to duel with this. And they think sparring mm. is, is fighting. Sparring develops great timing. You know, Paulo's found out. You know, I have my issues at times, you know, because Paulo is so strong-headed that sometimes he drives me nuts. But he's he wants to know. He <laughs> wants to know. So he tries everything. 100%. And you see him that he understands that you can't be just 20 feet away dueling. That that's eventually you've seen him. He gets in people's faces, banging, and finds out there's no safe way to do this. Mm -hmm. There's no safe way to do blades. I don't mean training. I mean in real, in, in an encounter. You do it. You've done Piper. You've done other. You've yeah, worked where, where, you've done different ways. None of it is a guarantee. There's nothing safe about it. Hardly. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think you and I brought this up in one of my other podcasts. Um, I see people and they still do it. I will teach you how to use knife and I'll teach you how not to get cut and always cut, mm -hmm. you know, take care of your opponent. And I roll my eyes because if I had said, I will teach you how not to get submitted, how not to get choked out and BJJ, no one would come train with me because they'd laugh at me. That's ridiculous. Everybody gets submitted. Everybody gets choked out. I don't care what level you're at. That's the whole point of it. Anybody on any given day. If I told you I could teach you how to box and you'd never get hit, yeah. nobody would train with you. They'd go, who are you kidding? Boxers get hit all the time. Oh, my God. Right. You know, and if I told you I could teach you kickboxing and teach you, you know, mutar so you never get kicked, you never get kneed, never get that famous clinch, yeah. no one would train with me. But people actually still to today advertise, I will teach you how to use a knife, not get cut, and I'll teach you how to disarm your opponent. 
And I understand that people go, these disarms don't work. And other people say, these disarms work. You know, you can make anything work at any given time to prove a point. Mm -hmm. I think the scariest part is they fail when you really think it should. Because you can do everything right in the knife world or a sword world, and, and it doesn't work. And the consequences you know? are expensive. Yes. And, you know, a lot of times, that would what interested me because a lot of the old sword manuals and they were pretty good about doing cartoony stuff like you know the blood coming they were always cutting off hands mm. and a lot of times the swords we find come with the matching hands in the museum you know there's a part of the gauntlet and you know depending on that's something else the way the tools were invented for blades that some of the stuff we do with stick work and people they put their hand down to stop an incoming thrust and go look we pat it and do whatever well, in Spanish days, I had a gauntlet on, a glove on, and the tool was locked into my hand with all its uh, basket weave. It couldn't go anywhere. So when I went to pass you, guess what was there? They Even my handle, my handle blocked it. And behind my handle was this gauntlet of leather and metal discs, and there's metal out here on my leather. Guess what? So that was safe. What happens later when it's bastardized? They do the same motions but I have none of the protection. And I go, you know, that's a bastardized version of old sword work. And if you read, you don't understand why it happened that you shouldn't do that with your empty hand, but people still do it. Why? Well, my instructor's instructor taught him and he taught me and we do this. I'm like, okay, if there was intent to harm you and cut your pieces off, you'd be an unhappy camper. And I, that's why when the early days, when people said we trained with live blades, well, we did. We took the fine edge off. My insurance company went nuts. We used fingerless gloves. We had leather gloves with protection, put extra protection mm -hmm. on our knuckles. We had leather gauntlets with discs on it. And we went at each other. And we still go through. The points were still there. I had a couple of students come to me and go, sir, you can see the blade stuck right through the glove and through their hand. And I'm like, okay, because we took the edge off, sort of. Mm -hmm. They would still cut, but and now I have lots of scars on my hands because we were crazy. We, you know, yeah, it wasn't no, razor no, sharp, no. so it was okay. Uh, the insurance company shut part of my school down and said you can't do can't that. Imagine that encouraged me to make training knives. <laughs> the other part is people trained with live blades don't make contact, and it's like old point sparring. I don't make contact. You know, Junry invented those foam pads not for contact, but for incidental, accidental contact. Mm -hmm. but of course, we're human beings. With pads on us, what do we do? Well, we still, oh, I can hit you now. I have a pad on. Well, that kind of thing holds true. All the people say they train with live blades, and we're, my guys back then were whips because we use drones. Said, you don't want to bump into a Bram person because you know what? We make contact all the time. Mm -hmm. So, in real, I'm going to put that blade on you because we're not worried about hitting you. We get bruises, we get bumped up, mm. but training blades, drones, like the Knights used to use in back in the old days, I got it. That's how we can actually make contact. And when mm. I get there in real, I don't stop right near you. I don't cut in the air to make sure I don't accidentally cut you. We freaking put our blades on you. And I say that the smallest, weakest person who trains with me, you want to bump into them while they have a live blade in their hand because they're going to make contact. They're gonna cut you. Hey GM, uh, Dave is saying goodbye. He has to go. He's uh, okay. basically saying, um, have to go teach. Um, uh, now, Goudin, Tito Brom. I'll listen to the complete inter interview when it's posted. Have a good evening. But yeah, thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, how can I hear? What? Um, this is a question um, from Andres. Three things that we need to remember regarding Remy, GM Remy. What three um, things, as far as you and like in your opinion, what three things come to the top of your head that we need to remember regarding GM Remy? Um, he wanted everyone to take, he didn't want anyone to be a clone of him. Mm. People try to be clones of him. He used to say, they want you to take this. And that's why, you know, Brian calls his art the art within art. He go, I want you to make this the art within your art. It has to become your art. And we still give credit to him, of course. But it has to be, and you need to innovate. 
and translate because if you can't innovate and translate, it's not yours. It's his. You're just doing it. You're just um, and okay. the other thing was he was an educator. He understood you don't make an art last by making participants. You make an art last by making instructors because instructors mm -hmm. teach the art and they find the essence of the art. And once they've made it their own, with our soul, we teach it to others. I teach with my soul because That's he taught true. me that. So the, and people go, well, it's changing. I said, all art sort of change, but they don't because our heart is still the core. I don't care if someone says, oh, there's all these different versions of modern East. Yeah, but you know what? At the core, they're the same. And those of us who are the teachers, and he ran instructor camps. He didn't run participant camps. He ran instructor camps. That's what I run. I run instructor camps. I have instructor mm -hmm. programs. I want people to learn. I'm a good father. You know, I want my kids to be better than me. And a lot of my students are. They do a lot of things much better than I do. They don't design better knives yet. I'm blessed on that. But, <laughs> you know, and the third thing I think is Remy used to say, I want people to have a good time. So you gotta have fun, right? <laughs> right. This is not fun mm -hmm. this is a very serious art and i tell people i'll make it a little romantic and play but i want you to understand what he did this art was designed for to keep people free it's one of the mm -hmm. few arts that hasn't become a sport we're just making it a sport now it wasn't a sport yeah, for right. hundreds of years it was used either via directly with the spanish and the chinese against the english against us against the japanese it was used as a war art and there's different levels of it. It's not that every version is a war art. And, you know, every guy hiding in the mountains is not some fantastic master. And just because it can twirl doesn't make them great. Yeah. But um, it took us till almost 10 years ago for President Gloria Royo to pass 9850. And that was Remy's dream that our niece, Kali, Eskrima, you know, which are secondary terms, uh, you know, our niece is the official Tagalog the official government term for it, that FMA, our niece, become the official sport culture. Sport culture means it's the cultural part that we talked about. It's the sport part, and it's what the military and the security teams use, the three phases of it. Um, and it's just getting to that point because, you know, when Remy was called the father of our niece, other people did the arts there, and a lot of them kept within their small group. Okay. You know, Remy was one of those who went, I want to spread it everywhere. And when he came here, it's because he was escaping for his life. Mm. Because Marcos was going to, you know, he was threatening. Like, and that's Roland Dante. So, well, I want to talk about irony that Roland Dante was given the job of killing Remy. So, you know, he shows up, confiscates one of his, like his official passport, drives him to the airport and uses his, puts him on a plane with a civilian passport and goes, bye. And then goes back and goes, I don't know where Remy Presos is. And that's when Remy comes to America. Uh, um, you know, and he came here and he became, you know, the man with the sticks and he traveled everywhere. But, and part of what you asked, what do I remember? The three things. He immediately started teaching basic stuff and said, take it back to your schools. Not, you know, and, he, and a lot of the Kempo people brought him in first because they were so open-minded and they had some Arnese yeah. in their you know, from in their arts to start with, that he would show up. Why did he start with Kempo? Well, they let him in, yeah. you know, right off the bat. And, you know, why did he teach single Sinawali? And people thought his simple single Sinawali. Simple is high, low, high, low. Um, single Sinawali is high, low, high, and then high, low, high. You know, the, the three count to it. But they tell people, go ahead and he goes, because people of all levels would take it back to their school and they would start understanding that basic motion. And he'd go, he'd go well, that's not it. I go, yeah, it is. They took it back to their school. They took some form of our niece as instructors back to their school. And guess what they're doing? They're teaching. Right. When they come to the next one, he goes, oh, look, if you stuck it in here. Oh, you can check this down and now come here. And now they start learning. Guess what? He's spreading instructors. He, sp he spread the art. So I, I would say those are the three things I got out of him were yeah. enjoy it, make instructors, and uh, make it your own. And they can have fun, 
right? Yeah. Um, you know, what do you, what do you plan? Uh, um, this is from two things from Chad. Uh, well, one from Chad, one from me. So this is from me. What do you plan to show at the camp coming this weekend? Oh, Chad's camp. Oh, Chad, I'm sorry. Good thing Dean brought it. I got so typical Bram carried no, away. No, no. Um, I Because I have three teaching slots, what I want to do is one slot I'm going to teach modular knife, which is based on a lot of this and the proper mm. use of knife work and to entry. Um, because we all do in like pocket stick and I have the crimped, I'm going to do one session of crimped and learning about, again, the same mode, but how can I do it in today's world? Because I can use a crimped in today's world and not go to jail. Mm. And then in Bolo, what I'm going to do is make sure we understand corner to corner and we're going to work in Abanico and its relationship to the back cut of a buoy. And then those who come to my birthday camp, we're actually going to do buoys, uh, old English style and American style, because that's uh, by the old the, the recreation of Stonehenge. And then later, the next day, we're going to do bolos on the beach like we're in the Philippines. Oh, wow. So, right. But fun. At the camp, I'm going to work on, like I said, corner to corner, understanding where can I go to get that arm break where can i go to get would be arm break or a disarm and what can i do with bolo like i try to do up close and personal and get that edge in there and protect myself be, and again i want to get it because i'm in florida you're up people have machetes and people just come at you mm -hmm. so i don't want to try to tell you be delicate and timing and dueling i'm going to i want to make sure people understand that it's, it's coming to cut you it's coming right at you. You think you're going to die? I'm going to hide behind it. And I'm not, I'm going to be right there. What do I do when I encounter it? In the camp, we're going to learn about go with the force. Something like Remy said, there are three ways. Force the force, go with the force, and meet the force. And I said meet the force last because that's what I use the most. I feel it, sort of cheese out, feel where your force is, and wherever you leave me, I go. And a little, again, on that, because I watched someone seeing me do something said, oh, I won't do an X block. I said, it's not. Remy taught us corsada. And a corsada, mm -hmm. whichever hand you bumped to get that you pushed, we let it go and the other hand came into play. Okay. We weren't doing X block and lock it wherever yeah. you made contact. So, you know, we would catch it. And that's how we would walk the center lock or we would walk it all the way through to side by side and we practiced and he go, look, you know, it's right there. Well, that's what we're going to do with this. And that became the same. I realized those are the same motions he taught us with a stick. And I'm going to show you what he did and what I innovate and translate with Bolo. Nice. So that's what we do with Chad's camp. And any of you who are in Florida, you can still show up. We're going to be in Arcadia. If you look up Progressive Arnice Camp on yeah. Facebook, it's there. And Dean will be there. I Dean will be, will be there. Grandmaster the Bruce flesh. will be there. I'll be yeah. there. Of course, Chad will be there because yes. Chad, Chad's camp. So Chad's question, um, why uh, why do you enjoy his camp so much? Why do I enjoy Chad's camps? Yeah. Um, I think I enjoy Chad's camps, A, because being at Chad's camp is like being at Chad's house. Ah, okay. Explain. Okay. Everybody is welcome. Chad makes everybody ah. welcome and feel comfortable. And he wants everyone to have a good time. And every guest is important. Mm. No guest is not important, as you've seen. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay. And I've been in places where, you know, once you teach, you're done. Yeah. And a lot of times people, they're just there. You're just as a showpiece. Yeah. Chad. Chad has this insatiable knowledge, like a lot of, and that's why that's why I brought up Paulo, because Paulo, in lots of ways, has an insatiable attitude to learn. But Chad has, and I think all of us do. You've never I think stopped. All of it, yeah, to a degree. Every time something comes up, yeah. you know, I mean, Paulo's in our face all the time, and I, I laugh about it. But you have never stopped learning. I never stopped learning. Chad never right. stops. So one of the greatest things about Chad's right. camp is a Chad is my family for almost thirty years. Mm. So me personally, like I said, it's like being anybody comes, he treats you like you're going to his house. Carmen's there. You know, she's the hostess. Chad is open. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Bruce, 
Bruce is part of the little three musketeers with me and Chad yeah. from the, the Remington of Florida. So for us, and, and why I love Chad's camp, and it probably doesn't work for a lot of other people in the way it works for me, is Bruce, Chad, and I, whoever leads off, the next guy, we don't teach something unique. We go, oh, you just did that with, with Bruce, or you did that with Chad here. Let me show you how I can translate it into what I do. If I go first, Bruce is going to go, you know, you just did this with Bram, and then Chad will come on and go, hey, let me show you what you did with these two guys. I think it's the fact that Chad wants you to share. And because we all share, he wants every student to absorb something and go, look how cool this is. It's a great time. Yeah, it's just yeah. such a uh, pleasant experience. There's no egos. Um, yeah. Or at least I didn't see or feel any anyway. I have never, never at Chad's camps. And we we live off of each other. Now, I want you to know, as I said, you know, Chad holds small training sessions at his house. Well, we're no different. I've mm -hmm. taught it at wherever Chad is for years and years. And Chad has come to me. And, you know, when you, at my birthday bash, we're one big happy family. And I'll take people out of the camp and go, I know you teach. And just, come on, you teach this session. Teach a session. Mm. Why? Because we all want to share. And Chad's like that. And yeah, we've been together enough time. We, and you've seen all of us want to do it. And there's some things I, you know, I don't do. And everyone gets it because, I, I, like I said, I don't want to. There's some habits. I watch everybody's session. Some things I'll, I'll go do. And, again, I'm one of those. I'm old enough. I'm the old guy out of the group. So some things I don't change, no force a habit I won't do. Um, but Chad trains in every session all the time. Chad goes on, he does. He can't see his evolution, you know, because it, it's Chad. But you come to Chad's camp, you can watch his evolution, and everybody is welcome. If you stand up, Dean, and you know, no matter what you want to teach, Chad will go, that's great, do it. Yeah, no, definitely very you open. You other camps, I have people go, uh, sir, I don't want you to teach this. Would you not do that? I'm like, that's absurd. Yeah. You know, Chad always goes, Bram, sometimes he gives me a list. He goes, would you teach this, this, and this? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Because I, I don't have enough time to teach everything. He goes, this is what the, what the students want to work on. But I go to Chad's camp because, like I said, it's like going to Chad's home. Mm. It's it's a comfortable place to be. Yeah, And definitely. Chad makes everybody feel that, but especially for me because I'm part of the family. I'm Chad's camp gives me a chance to be me, Bruce to be Bruce. And, you know, we're all crazies. And when you came, when you saw, you know, when, when Uncle Dan finally got there, when Brian's there, the rest of us, you know what? It's one big happy family. No, it was a great, it was a great time, great experience. Uh, highly recommend it, you know, if you can never make it. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I can't, nothing but positive, you know. Good. Um, yeah. You know, and you're welcome at my birthday bash. You know, I'll come do an FMA discussion live broadcast for my birthday when is that? bash. When's that? Um, July, I think it's 19 through 23. I have a five-day camp. I have 15 people doing five days. I'm going to done with those first two days, which is specific bolo and buoy special stuff. Okay. And, and they're all getting live blades for coming, and they're wow. getting a matching trainer. Uh then I'm going to do my regular instructor three. We roll right to my regular three day camp, but it's mm. in uh, Vancouver, Washington. Oh, no, uh, I think it's like the night. I'll, the I'll send a flyer okay. to you. Okay. And it's only 20 minutes north of Portland. Of, of Portland. Okay. Yeah, Portland. You know, so Dan will be there. Morgan Garrett will be there. Obviously, Mish will be there because Mish is one of the camp. You know, Chad's been out to a lot of them. I don't know if you, you know, Jason May will be this year. Uh, ben Aldrich is coming on out. Odessa's flying in from Iraq. So, uh, you know, we'll have a good group. You know, Mike Mather stops in to, to play and teach their Sifu Mike, you know, the, the Viking Grinch. Um, you know, we have a good group. That's awesome. Well, well, but well. you're always welcome. You know, you just got to yeah, I, mean, in I, um, I didn't. Yeah. I mean, it sounds pretty exciting. Um, what are you uh, closing th thoughts to the community? Well, I would say. Bolo gives you a different aspect to your stick work, mm. you know, um, and 
it's a way of preserving a legacy because there's, there's lots of different bolos in the Philippines. There's just no one kind. Um, this just happens, like I said, to be the precess bolo. And um, please, if you'd like to learn a little bit, uh, we have online courses. Come to one of my classes and learn. Bolo adds a sense of reality. And, and Remy's book, he says, right, Dan was surprised, right in the very opening pages, he goes, the stick is for practice only in real, in combat. The thing to use is a bolo. Yeah. That's the real tool. And, you know, Dan goes, that's in the pink book. I said, yeah, it's right here. Paid first page of writing and Remy's own forward. And there's like two chat, two paragraphs that talk about the bolo. And that's the real tool of our niece. Mm. He, he never said that. And you go, well, actually, yeah, in his very first book, he says it right there. The fact that all of you read the book and read the stuff and it went right by you. Just like him saying, oh, you cut this, or if I touch you, you're cut already. Oh, you have to know where the sharp is. Mm. Well, if you didn't pick it up now, back then, you can pick it up now because yeah. I swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, and I'm more than willing to share it. So my closing thing is Bolo exists. It's a separate thing. Remy didn't teach it in open. Um, and it's sort of like all the senior students who, when their master's gone, said, let me teach this in public to everyone. Let me share the art. Because if you don't, it's gone. Yeah, exactly. you know, A lot of the Tappy Tappy people didn't want to share the art when they became the masters of Tappy Tappy. And Brian became the pariah because he went, well, that's absurd. If I don't share it and make other instructors, it's going to die. Yeah. So that's what Brian did. You know, And at the Remy Prasas Foundation, every June, uh, according to Remy's will, you know, we meet. In Philadelphia, at the Remy Prasos Hall of Flame, like the Eternal Flame, mm. um, we have a two and a half day camp, and I teach Bolo there in his honor. Oh, you know, awesome. according to his will. So, anyways, Bolo adds a lot. My closing things are: um, remember from TacKnife.com, you don't have to buy expensive Bolos. These are great yeah. things for your school. And John has school prices, and he's going to have some of my. Shortly have my versions as well, okay. made in polycarbonate. So please, John Stanley at Tack Knife makes great training knives. So you can practice all this stuff safely at your school. We have courses. And uh, Dean can probably post or I'll post some links. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Post mm -hmm. Please, Bolo adds a reality. You'll go, oh, I used to do a stick. That was a stupid move. Let me show you. Come find out where the move came from. You know, awesome. Have a good time. Guys, uh, again, I didn't give you the most notice uh, for today, so I appreciate you coming on um, and doing this. And it looks like I'm going to be seeing you exactly in six days. like six days or a week. A week. It's Saturday. I'll I'll be there. I get there. Uh, I'll get there Friday morning, except it takes me about three and a half hours to yeah, drive. Yeah, I'll be there Friday midday. See, Eric's picking me up. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be there. Oh, yeah. All right. So I'll see you Friday. I should get there about midday because I'm going to leave about nine in the morning. I'll get there about noonish, you know, one, of, you know, 1300, you know, check into the hotel and then uh, we'll start a thing. And I, yeah, I teach Friday, Saturday and Sunday because I'm doing three separate mm -hmm. sections. Awesome. Well, GM, I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll see you soon. You got it. Thank you very much for again having me on, for letting me babble. Um, I hope I covered what I was supposed to cover because we, we got a little we covered other stuff when we're doing the test okay. run. Go all of you go watch the test run because Dean and I talked about other stuff as I sort of got carried away there as well. Anyways, I love you all. Be safe and in and in Remy's words, you know, you can do this, baby. All right. All right. Well you take it out. See you soon. Okay. Thank you, Dean. Have a great night. You as well. Okay. Bye bye. And that wraps up 371. Who is next? Um, Tuesday night, uh, bringing on Tim Hartman and somebody else. That's somebody else I don't know who it's going to be yet. But the decades, we've been going over modern niece, the decades. What changed throughout the decades? 70s, 80s, 90s. And mm -hmm. there. Um, so that's going to be there. Also, if. Um, you're in the area, that being Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, even New York. This is happening. And, oh, uh, uh, Brian, 
I need uh, I need somebody to uh, Bowie knife if you want to come on. Uh, but this could be happening. Uh, <clears throat> lost my train of thought here. So much for multitasking. A week from this coming Saturday, so the 11th, and uh, basically it's going to be uh, just raising money for this unfortunate cancer victim, Michael McQueen. So all the proceeds are going to him. And again, you kind of just choose what you want to do. You can do anything and all that. So yeah, check that out. But uh, all right, folks, I want to thank you for those who watch, and I will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.